Our next speaker is Neil Yorio, and he is the Vice President of Lighting and Research for BIOS. Uh, there's a couple cool things that, uh, that he's done that I wanted to, come on up here, come on up here. So he, he, he worked for NASA for 20 years um, and participated in several agricultural lighting research programs with bioregenerative life support programs, which all I can think of is the movie The Martian. And so I'm basically giving him credit for keeping Matt Damon alive. Um, it's probably extremely, extremely inaccurate, but... Um, uh, and then he, he also is uh, an internationally recognized expert in electrical lighting systems and controlled environment crop production. So that sounds pretty applicable to what we're doing here, right? Um, huge advocate for LED lighting and research and a lot of great information that's coming out of that. So without further ado, Neil Yorio. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here amongst all of you today. And I want to um, I want to make this kind of fun, but I also want to make it kind of educational. So this discussion today is going to be a little bit historical. I hope it's a little bit fun, a little bit of fun, and then it's going to talk about how we're incorporating the types of work that we did at NASA into the current state of cannabis production today. And I hope that that's something that's going to be relevant to a number of you. I'm sure it is, since that is the mainstay or the basis for which this industry is, is, uh, is, is based upon. Okay, so um, I'm also, uh, as the Vice President of uh, BIOS uh, for Lighting Research, I also serve as a Technology Advisor for Denver Relief, which is one of the first uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, legal ones, in Colorado. So I'm using this uh, uh, experience to help them with their customers talk about how to incorporate lighting into their uh, grow production facilities. Prior to that, as mentioned, I worked for NASA for 20 years, uh, looking at different types of uh, lighting systems and how to use lighting to be the energy basis of a life support system to keep people alive for long duration space missions. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the beginning of this presentation. Okay, so the title is NASA, The Evolution of Light from NASA to Outer Space, and you're probably thinking, well, isn't NASA all about outer space anyway? Why does he have to emphasize that? Well, the first, uh, oops, sorry. So this is, uh, I'm trying to use the pointer here. There it is. This is Buzz Aldrin, appropriately named, uh, the second man to walk on the moon. And during this period of time in our history, 1969, uh, it demonstrated NASA's ability to, or capability, to explore outer space. And having uh, demonstrated that capability, it began to, uh, the agency began to look at longer duration missions and going farther into space. So a mission to Mars became a reality. If we landed on the moon, we can go, we can go to Mars. However, that's a very long period of time with which person, the people have to be traveling in outer space without any umbilical cord back to Earth. So it demonstrated that we needed to figure out ways to recycle everything that we brought with us on this mission and be as efficient in everything that we do as possible, including how much energy that we use. So these types of um, conceptual models, uh, a Martian uh, base here showing plants being grown in a greenhouse was part of that life support system. So plants are removing carbon dioxide that we breathe out, they're creating oxygen, they're purifying water through the process of transpiration, and at the same time, as a side benefit, they create food at the same time. So that's the carbon part of the recycling that's going on in the system. That led to then the development of a test bed at Kennedy Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, which is where I worked, and that's where a lot of this controlled environment crop production studies occurred, where we really began to figure out what this life support capability was. And so the connection to outer space here is that a lot of this work was done to help develop the indoor horticultural and agricultural techniques to produce what I like to call um, cannabis, in this particular case, a strain called outer space. So that's NASA to outer space. So going back in time um, to, the, to the 1980s, this test bed was used to characterize the life support capability of various crops. 
These particular crops were selected based on their, uh, their carbon and nutritive input to the human diet because obviously this is going to be a food source for people for long periods of time. They could be away from Earth for several years if, it, if you're talking about a Mars mission. So it's very important to focus on the human health uh, aspects of this. But at the same time, um, these crops are actually performing these other life support functions. And so, whoops, sorry about that. And so a number of different crops were grown, important food crops, wheat, tomatoes, lettuce, soybeans, and potatoes in this particular chamber. This chamber uh, was originally used to test Gemini capsules, for, it's a hyperbaric chamber to test Gemini capsules for leaks prior to them being launched into space. So NASA repurposed this particular chamber to become now a closed environment plant growth chamber. It has 20 square meters of canopy area, and it uses 400 watt high pressure sodium lamps as the light source. And um, we were able to demonstrate very, very effectively that this is a viable life support option. So I mentioned we were using high pressure sodium lights in this particular chamber. High pressure sodium lights at the time were the most efficient light source with the highest light output at the time in the 1980s. And so uh, that was the basis of this test. And we were looking at light response to light responses to plants in terms of that life support capability. So in this particular graph, it shows that as you increase the light level, you get an increase in yield. And so it's a linear response. The more light, the more yield. The more yield, the more life support output of this particular uh, system. But giving the plants more light means giving the plants or requiring more energy to do so. And energy is an extremely high premium when you're talking about the equation of a life support system or any type of space related exploration endeavor. So we had to look at ways of minimizing the amount of energy used in the system so that it could be a sustainable, long duration, reliable system. So there are a lot of technologies out there that are being marketed for horticultural applications, um, including fluorescent lighting, high pressure sodium, metal halide, LEDs, among others. And we looked at all of them and evaluated them all in terms of their application for this particular uh, system. However, it's important to note that all of these electric light systems, despite what you might hear or read, were never developed for growing plants. They're all human lighting technologies that just happen to be good at, as, as a light source for growing plants due to their spectrum and their efficiency. None of them are optimized for plant growth. They just happen to be good your decent sources of light. So, LEDs ended up turning out to be um, a very promising technology source because of their solid state nature, their small volume and size, uh, their energy efficiency, uh, their safety and reliability, and their, and their longevity, how long they last. Not to mention the fact that they, um, you have a much uh, wider uh, flexibility with the spectrum you can create with a wide variety of LEDs, and they don't contain mercury. And that was a huge issue with other electric light sources in a closed environment in outer space. If you lose a lamp, one breaks or blows up, now you've contaminated your system with mercury, and you can't roll the windows down and vent it out. You're stuck with it. And of course, mercury is an incredibly toxic poison for people. So begs the question with all of these electric light sources for human applications being marketed for lighting for plants, do plants and people see the same light? And effectively they do see the same range of wavelengths of light, but they see it in very, very different ways. And so I'm gonna to attempt to explain that with this particular graph. So this, oops, I keep doing that. So this blue line represents the light absorption of leaves based on the wavelength of light they're receiving. So the higher the number, the more efficient the, that leaf is absorbing that wavelength of light. This, cur this curve is called the McCree response curve. And it's a very good way to look at how a spectrum of light is influencing how a plant grows due to its efficiency of absorption. And this curve 
then allowed for the definition of photosynthetically active radiation, which is this square box right here, which is all the photons of light between 400 and 700 nanometers. That defines photosynthetically active radiation. That's what's driving photosynthesis and growth in plants. The yellow line in the middle is the photopic response curve of the human eye. And it's a weighted number that tells, that, that uh, is, a, is a measure of brightness that our brains see. Our, brain, our eyes are the sensor, our brain is interpreting the information that our eyes are telling it, and it sees brightness. That is an incorrect or irrelevant measurement for applying to plants. So we do see the same rough range of light, but in very different ways. And then the last line is an example of an LED spectrum that shows that you can create a spectrum of light where all of the light is in that PAR box. So you're only creating wavelengths of light with the watts that you're spending for wavelengths that the plants are actually going to use. Other important definitions are photosynthetic photon flux, um, which is the amount of light that comes out of a fixture, and then photosynthetic photon flux density, which is how much light is reaching that surface. That is what you use to predict your growth and yield in your crop. So how do different lights compare to each other on a level playing field? This is a paper from Jake Nelson and Bruce Bugley of Utah State University. And they surveyed several different types of lighting uh, technologies to see how they compare to one another. The important thing to look for here is the, um, the different types of lights or HPS, LED, ceramic metal halide fluorescent. And the important thing to look here are the watts. The watt reading, so how much energy you're using, how much light is coming out of the fixture is, is a, in terms of PPF or micromoles per second, and then how effective those watts are at making light that the plants are going to use. So that's photon efficacy here. Double-ended high-pressure sodium has gone through a major evolution in that it became one of the, one of the best efficient lights but it's still HPS, it still has all the same problems as HPS has. LEDs now are rivaling that, in fact, even surpassing it in some, in some cases. That's a point at it. And so now we have a promising technology with LEDs that can, it's energy saving and can now replace high pressure sodium lights. Rounding out the list at the bottom, these other technologies are really not even in the same ballpark in terms of photon efficacy and application for this particular type of uh, grow environment. And when I'm talking about grow environment here, I'm specifically referring to commercial crop production, not, you know, basement and closet growers. So now that L NASA and other academic institutions have validated LED as a promising technology, begun proving that it's working in these particular types of applications, uh, you see it on the space station today. So in this particular slide, um, there's a nanorack system, which is an experimental system on the space station. You can plug in different modules to do different types of experiments. One of those modules is called the veggie unit. And they, so far they have grown lettuce, and this is what it looks like under the red spectrum. And then out in the crew compartment, it is actually a purple colored lettuce. It doesn't just look purple under the spectrum. And then just recently, they have produced the first ornamental flower, is any flower. You probably have seen that in some of the recent uh, news about research on the space station. So NASA's using it. NASA's using LED technology. How does that relate to what we're talking about here with cannabis production? So LED type lighting technology significantly improves all of these aspects of lighting for commercial crop production. Light intensity. We know that the, the quantity of light, photons of light in that photosynthetically active radiation range is what's driving photosynthesis and growth in the plant. We can now match and beat that with all the other incumbent technologies with, with LED. The selection of technology now allows for creating spectra that are the most efficient in producing photons of light that plants are going to use per watt consumed. You now have an infinite amount of selection of spectra. You can now choose different LEDs that give you completely different spectrum compared to incumbent lighting technology where you're stuck with one spectrum. You have an HPS spectrum, you have a fluorescent spectrum, you have a metal halide spectrum. You can't really change that. Manufacturers are adjusting those in some ways, but you're basically stuck to the basic chemistry of those lamps that provide that spectrum. Uniformity, very often overlooked by lighting technology manufacturers, but probably one of the most important aspects of this. Um, 
consistent and uniform lighting across the canopy is paramount to consistent production quality and yield in your production facility. Energy savings, we talked about that. LEDs are very efficient at creating light, um, typically up to 50% overall system efficiency. So if they talk about cutting your electricity bill in half by changing to the technology used to create your crop. Longevity and durability, they're solid state devices, they last a long time. Uh, in the proper configuration, uh, you can make very durable, high quality products that are very applicable for a commercial crop production facility. So when people think of LED lights, they think of purple light. It's a terrible light to see anything under. And in fact, this slide is, uh, is a good example of that. You see these plants that look purple or black. It's very hard to tell what's going on uh, in this particular uh, grow facility. And the reason why they make purple LED lights is because um, folks were, manu were looking at focusing on the absorption of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll has two, chlorophyll A and B has two absorption peaks in the blue and the red. So people were putting blue and red LEDs together and saying we're maximizing the absorption of chlorophyll and therefore we have a purple light. In reality, there's lots of uh, um, uh, pigments in plants that absorb light and contribute to this. So we know that just focusing on a couple wavelengths of light is not going to get us there. So a high output, broad spectrum LED spe uh, fixture is a, is a reality. In fact, it, it exists today. And here's some examples of, here's an HPS spectrum where you see the orange or yellow uh, bias in the spectrum. Kind of hard to tell what's going on in there. Here's a purple spectrum back here. Here's a broad spectrum. And it looks very much like a broad spectrum white light um, fixture. So now this provides a lot of benefits to the grower. First of all, you have improved color saturation as well as improved working environment for the people in the grow facility. They are not getting headaches. They're not stressed out by this these weird altered spectrums of light. You have an improved photosynthetic absorption efficiency because all of these other uh, pigments in the plant are being stimulated and contributing to the overall photosynthetic response. Very importantly though, now the human um, that's working in that facility has the improved ability to detect insects and diseases and other types of problems in their growth facility that is much more easily detected with our human vision system. It's our sensor for checking on our growth facility, how we're doing. And this allows you to get very early and easy assessment of the status of your facility. However, there are risks with LED selection. And the list is long. And I'm going to hit the high points right here. But number one is that there are no standards in the lighting industry for reporting or describing how different electric lights compare to one another so that you can make a knowledgeable decision on which technology is right for your grow facility. Um, there's a lot of erroneous claims and a lot of misleading information out there from different sources and very confusing and conflicting. So it makes it very difficult for people to look at this technology and make any kind of reasonable judgment on it because of this, uh, all of this misinformation that's out there about it. So, so be warned. The lack of expertise to integrate the LED technology, this is a big problem because a lot of manufacturers are actually taking repurposed fixtures from other applications and slapping a grow light label on it, selling you the fixture and wishing you luck. They have no way of telling you how to actually integrate the technology to grow facility. So they, it's, 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 it's a change of technology which comes with a change in horticulture. You need to understand the horticultural environment in order to incorporate the new technology. There's a lot of consumer grade products uh, on the market that are being marketed for commercial. And this is, this is also kind of a big issue because you are commercial producers. You're not going to use a lawnmower on your farm to harvest your crop. You're going to use a John Deere tractor. You want that John Deere tractor to be the equipment that you use on your farm. You don't want to have you know, something that's not long lived or durable or robust uh, to, to be that tool you use to make your living. Um, a lot of products have overcomplicated features. Um, they have unnecessary features that make it more difficult to use and add a lot of unnecessary risk to your grow operation. Not to mention the fact that once you start putting in unnecessary features, you begin to dilute the quality of the product. The ability for it to be robust 
um, an optimal product performance. Lighting uniformity is something I stressed earlier. The, you need to have, you need to choose a, a technology regardless of whether it's LED or HPS or metal halide that gives you very uniform lighting across the canopy because as a commercial producer, you are manufacturing a product. And if you have a variable light source and a variable product, you are not doing your customers any favors by having a variable product. So you wanna have very even light distribution to, to maintain the yield, consistently across the plants, the canopy of plants, as well as the quality. Both of those things vary with light level and quality across the canopy. So a lot of LED products are out there uh, that are not commercial grade, and you need to know the difference. So, when, so I serve on a committee with the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, and we're addressing this issue of standardization right now. We're in the process of defining these requirements for reporting lighting performance. And so this is a little, this is a look in the future, the rest of the data on this slide, because this is what you're gonna start seeing people having to um, report in their spec sheets. And this is what you should be looking for today. Even though it's not out yet, this is what you should be looking for today because folks that are using this information and describing their performance in this way are ones that you should be talking to. You look at total amount of light in terms of the, the, the plant terms of micromoles of photons of light per second. That's how much light the fixture is producing. How efficient is it? How much light is it producing per watt being consumed? Look at things like actual fixture wattage and not a summation of the rating of the LEDs uh, in conjunction with the number of LEDs. Those are two things I see a lot of people ask the question. They're both completely irrelevant to the end user when describing fixture performance. Look at light maps. Do, are they able to show you what kind of light distribution you have over the canopy? Look at certified third-party photometric analysis. Don't just take the manufacturer's word for it. Look for somebody else to independently verify that. Legitimate case studies as well. How are others doing with that particular lighting technology? What types of yields are they getting? What types of processes are they using in their horticultural facility to get those types of yields? And how are those applicable to your crop production facility? So speaking of case studies, uh, I have one in here as an example. I mentioned before I'm a technology advisor for Denver Relief in Colorado. And this is a study we did comparing HPS versus LED. In this particular table up here, uh, we had a one strain called Gorilla Glue number no. four, which is a very nice strain for those familiar with it grown under HPS or an LED. 12 plants were grown under each particular light source, and it's, it's important to note that these were grown in two different rooms so that we can independently control the environment the plants were exposed to under these different lights. The uh, total plant rate was a little higher under LED. The flower fresh rate was also higher under the LED. And this thing is interrupted. And then the um, trim weight was significantly higher under the HPS. And so what that shows is that there's a significant carbon partitioning between the trim parts of the plant, the leaves and the stem, versus the flowers. And it's the flower that's the business part of this plant. So a very significant increase in flower um, was observed. Uh, no in influence whatsoever on THC content, so we're, we're not impacting the quality. And that yield uh, resulted in a 47% increase in flower dry weight. That's very significant when it comes to the bottom line and you're calculating revenue streams that you're able to now produce more product for less input costs, less electricity. So we got the yield, what about the quality? I mentioned THC was unaffected. Well, this is an analysis from that same study of terpenes. 10 different terpenes were measured. Of those 10, um, there's the HPS, and then there were two, uh, a duplicate run with the LED, so they were averaged together in this last column. But when you compare the two, the HPS versus the LED, seven of those terpenes came out significantly higher under an LED than under the HPS spectrum. Two of them were insignificantly different, meaning that they were, they were the same, and only one was slightly lower. So what does this mean for, for the business part? So an ROI, return on investment. Uh, this, in this particular example, 20,000 square foot facility, selecting an appropriate commercial grade LED fixture, a grower can expect $340,000 
in annual energy savings. $170,000 saving in maintenance costs, that's lamps and ballasts and cleaning and other labor uh, associated with maintaining a lighting system. $2 million in increased revenue as a result of both this, this input savings, the energy savings and maintenance savings, plus an increase in yield, a modest increase in yield, those combined significantly increase the bottom line for the grower. So these cost savings have a significant ROI, and typically it's less than a year for uh, switching to LED, whether it be retrofit or new construction. So it's a very simple formula. Taking leading edge LED technology at this point in time, it's rivaling and beating uh, incumbent technologies, um, plus cannabis production is going to increase, result in increased revenue. And I thank you for your attention.